Hi, and welcome to Season 1, Episode 2 of Migrations, a podcast where I interview creative and political Asians, talk about their migration story, and how it informs their work. I am so excited to have you all here with me on this journey. But this journey requires a lot of work. It requires production, editing, and I'm really hoping to make this podcast accessible. I can only do this with your help. So please visit my Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash migrations, that's M-I-G-R-A-S-I-A-N-S, and please contribute whatever you can, even if it's just a dollar. Your contribution will help to make this podcast that centers Asian voices more accessible to everybody. I really, really appreciate your support. And now let's get started on the second episode. Hey everyone. So today I'm interviewing Tiffany Wong. Tiffany identifies as a cisgender female, a second generation Chinese American, an artist, a painter, a poet, a writer, and a social justice advocate. You might not think that you know Tiffany, but you kind of do. She is the talented artist who designed the Migrations podcast cover art. I reached out to her because I was really drawn to her shades of yellows and browns that she exudes in her work, and I really couldn't think of a better way to depict the spirit of this show. Her parents grew up in Hong Kong when it was under Britain's rule, and they immigrated here in the 80s. Tiffany was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area. You can find Tiffany on Instagram at Tiffany Wong Art, and her website is www.tiffanywongvisualart.com. So welcome, Tiffany. I'm so excited for you to be here. Hi, I'm so excited to be here with you. Yeah, yay. Thanks so much for being a guest on the show. And I kind of want to just dive in. Can you tell us a little bit about the art that you create? Sure. Oh, the art that I create. Um, it's something that started out as a self-practice that um, really didn't have any like specific goal, which I, I think that is really important to like my mission, which it like which play and curiosity is a huge part. And over the past six to seven years, it's progressed. Um, it progressed with me, like how I changed my art changed with me and things that I deal with and want to address. Yeah, like the artwork has always been there for me. So at this point, something that is really important for me is talking about how do I address my internal oppression? How do I heal? How do I do decolonizing work? So just as much as I'm working on these things and exploring these sorts of life themes, my artwork also expresses the same. Awesome. You hit on so many interesting subjects right there. One thing that really struck out to me was how you talked about how your art also represents, you know, how you work through some internalized oppression. So can you talk a little bit about your migration story and how that relates to the art you do and this oppression? Sure. So I guess I should start with my parents. Um, my parents grew up in Hong Kong, under the British rule and in the 80s, when they were in their late 20s, they decided to move to California. And then they had me and my sister. And yeah, also a bunch of my extended relatives also moved to California at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in a Chinese household my first language is Chinese Cantonese mm -hmm. and basically like my whole early childhood I was surrounded by really only my family and Asians and not until really later in like grade school and then definitely like high school was I in more like um, white spaces so I don't know I just feel like probably for most Asian Americans it's like you think your everything is so kind of normal in a way. Mm -hmm. And then you look back and you're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> that was so packed 
And yeah, so in the past, especially five years, I've been doing a lot of grieving Mm -hmm. of things that I didn't know I had to grieve. And a lot of it is just grieving at the internalized oppression. And we're not even talking about external oppression. Sure. Um, grieving internal oppression of how I saw myself, how I saw my parents, how I saw my community, and grieving a lot of things that because I wished growing up that I was white and that I was different and that I wished that I talk different and move different and look different so yeah so that internalized oppression is just I think it's going to be a lifelong process sure I can definitely understand that process of grieving and it really struck me when you said grieving something that you didn't even know what was there and I think that that's really important to do but also you know you don't realize like what you have to grieve sometimes I mean I felt that way after my father passed away seven years ago, I'm realizing things now that like I never, ever realized before. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that's not like exactly parallel, but I understand that like process of grieving, it's things come from places you don't even know. Mm, Exactly. It's so layered because there's grieving in this like racialized identity, but there's also things that as I'm growing and progressing as an adult, like there's so many things to grieve when it comes to trauma and it all connects. Sure. Can you talk a little bit more about how it connects? Yeah, like part of it is like realizing a lot of things that I lost in childhood, which I guess I won't go into right now Sure. when it comes to like a familial trauma, mm-hmm. but how it connects to how I viewed myself mm. and how I viewed how I was developing my sense of worth as a child sure so there's like the piece that is within family that is connected to also my sense of identity as a chinese girl which is also connected to my parents worldview of work ethic and how did they connect to their emotions you know and then how they project it towards their children Yeah, that projecting, that's something I've definitely relate to. So I understand what you mean. And yeah, I mean, even thinking about the connection of work ethic to worth, you know, Mm -hmm. and what that means in the context of productivity in this world we live in, I think is really fascinating and complicated. Yeah, exactly. I was just talking to a friend. Um, So I grew up as a classical pianist. Uh, And I actually studied that in college. Oh, cool. But I remember at a pretty young age, like eight or nine, I remember specifically thinking like, oh my gosh, if I worked hard enough on every single measure and repeated it 1,000 times, I can get it perfect. Right. Wow. And I was addicted to that idea. Like, (laughs) oh my gosh, like if you work hard enough, you literally can be perfect. (laughs) Yeah. Now I look back, I was like, oh my God. Yeah. Wow. And you were so young and it, just thinking about that perfectionistic ideal at that age. I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying like practice and get better at things, but right. perfectionism right. is its whole other, you know, ideal. Yeah. And it's just like kind of wild how I've really brought that kind of thinking Mm -hmm. into everything. Sure, sure. Well, I want to go back a little bit to when you were talking about your migration story and talk a little bit about how you said, you know, when you looked back, you thought, wow, this is normal. And Mm -hmm. I was curious because you talked about how you were very immersed in your Chinese community, but then you, you know, got to school and started seeing a lot more of whiteness. So I actually wasn't totally sure which one you saw as normal. Can you talk more about that? Yes. So when I was younger, I thought it was totally normal to be surrounded by Asians. I mean, because that's all I really knew. Sure. But I remember how that really changed was when I was talking to my other Asian friends who had white friends specifically. I remember these specific moments where 
I was listening to them talk about their one or two white friends at their school and me being really envious and being like, oh my gosh, what is that like? Because obviously I was exposed to media and TV and movies, but like, I was like, oh my gosh, what is it like to have like a best friend who's white? And, and that was something that I wanted and thought that that was like so valuable. Right, right. But even in that situation i thought that was a normal thing to like a once or a normal conversation to have yeah yeah i mean the topic of normalcy i think is really interesting because i remember reading americana and okay. i remember shimimanda ngozi idiche i think i'm pronouncing it right i hope so um talking about how when she you know, grew up in Africa and how, you know, being black was normal, you weren't othered. And how being in your Chinese community, you kind of had a sense of normalcy, but then at the same time, exposing yourself to, you know, white friends and everything was more valuable. And I think yeah. that that's a really interesting reflection of like the idea of worth and how that relates to white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's like even in a, I would say, pre-protected environment, white supremacy and whiteness was still so pervasive sure. and just like really was still in the air and in everything that I breathed. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was just talking to someone a few weeks ago about, you know, racism and everything in general. And um, she had asked me about white supremacy and, you know, how that gets reflected in imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I responded literally with, you know, white supremacy is in the air we breathe. It's not like just a side thing that, you know, we talk yeah. about. Yeah. So I definitely, definitely can relate to, cause yeah, even myself with um, the Indian community, I was surrounded by, I definitely like felt, felt normalcy, but then when you go outside of that protection, mm -hmm. you're like, Oh wait, <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> I see what's quote unquote normal now, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about your art process? Sure. So my art process Oh, it has really changed over the past couple years. And, but something that I think has stayed the same, and I guess I'll tell you a little bit of like how it's a little bit different, um, is I really like to use it in a way that isn't just like art or just like, this is my creation time. It's something I think that is reflective of everything else holistically. So I see it as an open door where I can be fully present in my mind and body and soul. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this already, but I really struggle with being embodied. Uh, I get really stuck in my head and I can live in the past or the future, which I think is really normal <laughs> for most people. But yeah. it's like I have definitely looked back and being like oh my gosh like I'm pretty sure I've lived most of my life not in my body so the first thing is that art and, or whatever I'm doing in creating is an open door for me to feel safe in my body to trust my body to be in real time and in 3d world so that is kind of the foundation of my art process and then I've developed over the years a couple of things that can give myself a bit of structure because for me, it's too overwhelming to go into creating an art piece with absolutely no boundaries, I guess. So things that I know you said that you were drawn to are like yellows. I love yellow because it's always represented memory and nostalgia, warmth and yeah, that sort of feeling. And browns are about earth and groundedness, especially that red brown. I love that warm feeling because it pulls me down to the earth. And there's also a lot of movements that I use that a lot of times represent joy. I think that joy has been a huge theme in my art process because I've been really learning about how having joy, talking about joy, pursuing joy is just one of the most radical decolonizing acts of resistance that we can do and it's something that's new for me because I've 
I don't know, been really stuck in the misconception that being a fighter and activist means denying all of me for the community, which is like actually super white supremacist <laughs> and yeah. very oppressive. Wow, that's intense. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Right? Uh, it is intense and it's like one of the things I've learned of just like okay that piece needs to go <laughs> yeah definitely fill that with joy right yeah and that's like I mean talking about internalized oppression it's like it really needs to be a practice because even now I'm saying that it's like I believe it but not really like it hasn't settled in deep enough I don't know I just feel like a baby in it I'm like, really? Are you serious? Like, I don't need to, like, really take down my health for the better good. <laughs> yeah, wow. I totally hear you on that. And in terms of, I mean, there's so many things, like, in a lot of ways, if you sacrifice your health, you get out of that embodied sense that you were talking about with your art process, right? Like, staying in your body, you know, experiencing and creating joy within your art, like in that moment. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Um, so what else can I say about my art process? I was just going to um, yeah, focus on yeah. the, what you were talking about, like doing things in real time. Yes. As opposed to like thinking about the past or thinking about the future, kind of what we do in our head. Yeah. How that like represents embodiment and decolonization. I think that that's like the interplay of those within art, any type of like modality of art um, is really important and like goes against basically like white supremacy. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Like being in the present is just, I think something that is really, really difficult to do because like liberation is about now. Mm hmm. I mean, it's about an imagined future, but really if like we could just get stuck in the past or just the future, there isn't any charge or energy to right now, like in our generation, in our time, in our life. And it's just like, that's true hope that we get to experience some of these things. And also to like give credit to those who have been before us. They've done so much work to set us up for now. Yeah. Wow. Definitely. I love how you talked about how, you know, what liberation has to do with is now like, you know, one would think that it's about, you know, liberation for the future and for future generations. And maybe it is, but the way to go about it very well has to be in the present about what's occurring at this very moment. Yeah, exactly. Wow. I really love that. So what exactly about the art process do you think is decolonizing specifically? I mean, I know we talked about, you know, embodiment and whatnot, um, but what do you do like when you start a piece specifically that, you know, helps you get into your body or is it just something that you just start? I mean, like kind of like a chicken egg thing, you start and you get in your body or do you do something beforehand? Mm -hmm. um, I don't do this every single time, but a lot of times I do start the day with meditation Mm -hmm. And I think that that's kind of like an easy or like a good way for me to be like tapped into my breath and into my body. And also I like to have a creative session that is led by intuition. Mm. And something else I really like to do, which is free write before I get into a session, which is just practicing how do I be aware of my voice that is always editing myself. Oh, wow. Okay, and kind sure. of releasing it and or being at least aware of it so that when I'm actually ready to paint, my editor voice is, I don't know, something that isn't against me. Yeah, that's really cool using like different modalities to get into the art making modality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those two things I think are very helpful. Yeah, and I think the intuition itself has a lot to do with the present as well. Yes. Cool. Very cool. Um, you know, and all of that, like we were talking about the present and, you know, staying in the now does make me think about like time. And I know you and I have talked about our relationship with time. Can you talk a little bit more about what your relationship with time is and how it's evolved? Yes. I still feel like very new in the journey, but I've noticed that my relationship with time 
is really oppressive where I feel like time is always out to get me. Time is always trying to put me down to tell me that I'm lazy and that I'm not doing my full potential. And so there's this very like dictatorship sort of wagging finger feeling with me and time. And I recognize that, I don't know, I, I want to heal that. I think that's the white supremacy and capitalism and patriarchy, all the things yeah. are kind of wrapped up in that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm on a journey of how do I reframe it? How do I heal from it? How do I have time as my friend? something to partner with and and something that is not so rigid because I think that's a very Western kind of way of thinking about time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, we all have our calendars like synced to our phones, not everybody, but a lot of people do, Um, you know, like we have this interview scheduled, you know, all of these things are the reality that we live in. And I think the eternal question is how to balance that reality you know, which is definitely yeah. situated within capitalism to changing our relationship with time, like at, at the same time, no pun intended yeah. there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's super challenging. Are, are there any like specific strategies that you've used or that you've thought about for that? Yeah. Okay. So you may also made a good point because like, I do like a good schedule and I like being on time and time is a thing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, but I think that in a way, giving myself structure, like, okay, in the next two hours, I'm going to, like, so within that, you know, that structure, I can work on resting, which is, I feel like resting in an intentional way is definitely kind of a going against capitalism and time productivity um, pressure. Sure. Yeah. So I feel like at least being aware of it and giving it pockets so that I can do something that I don't normally or naturally do. Yeah, so like like, disrupting the time almost, right? (laughs) Right. Like I want to not feel guilty. Yeah. And yeah, figuring out how to practice that. Yeah, definitely. And I think it is really hard when you are so passionate about the work you do and liberation is now and it is urgent, like, you know, liberation and fighting white supremacy. It's an urgent issue. It's affecting the lives of everybody, the climate, all of it. But at the same time, we need to experience joy in order to get there and experience those naps and rest and rejuvenation. Yes, it's so hard. (laughs) Yeah, it is hard because it's almost like we can't get attached to the outcome, but we could be hopeful of the outcome, right? Yes, exactly. And it's so hard because I haven't exactly even learned what that would look like what does that balance look like because I feel like in my personality it feels like I'm sometimes very extreme it's like all or nothing sure and I am looking forward to like continuing to heal so that I can experience more multi-dimensional things at the same time yeah yeah definitely experiencing like dualities or more than mm-hmm. dualities <laughs> simultaneously. Yeah. yeah, it's it's yeah, it's crazy because it's all work, but I think it's also um, we could think about it as work in terms of like, like you said, losing all of yourself for the purpose, which is like totally, if anything, against the purpose, right, of what we want to do. Or we could think about all of it as an act towards being more embodied in ourselves and therefore like being more humanistic in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yes. And just prioritizing joy and pleasure without any guilt is just like that in itself is winning. Like if we can do that as, you know, black and brown people, like, oh my gosh, like we're, you know, we're, we're doing it. (laughs) Yeah. I've definitely come to really enjoy the NAP Ministries Instagram page (laughs) that talks about the revolutionary acts of rest and and taking naps. And um, I've always been a napper, but I I, I have also felt like guilty, you know, that, you know, I could be doing something with that time, but what's mm. telling me that I have to, you know, it's all these constructs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I wanted to go back a little bit talking about trauma and how that has evolved for you or how you represent it in your art and how much you share or, you know, don't share with others. Yes. 
Oh gosh, trauma process. It's a long time coming and where I am presently is like what I've been focusing on most like in my life but also naturally through art is how do I practice self-compassion in the healing process because I've noticed that with the same mentality as I was talking about earlier about like if I play this measure a million times then it'll be perfect Mm -hmm. I've recognized that I've also taken that approach when it comes to healing. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Oh my gosh, this is ironic. (laughs) I need to heal. It needs to happen now. I need to keep practicing, dang it. (laughs) Exactly. Like my therapist used to always say this, like, why do you feel like such a rush in healing? Because you're so intense about it. (laughs) And I was like, because faster the better right (laughs) she's like it doesn't work like that it's not linear and you can't rush it I'm like really watch me (laughs) yeah watch me but I mean it's true it's just like the process is changing the tone of voice towards myself right and understanding that in that self-kindness in being present and gentle that that is the healing And learning how to slow down and have patience. Yeah, so that's kind of where I am right now. What was the second part that you were saying? Yeah, I was talking about how is healing through that trauma a public display versus something that's private? Like, you know, you and I both have Instagram pages and we, we talk about like what's going on with us. I write about it. You illustrate and paint about it and you know you do your own free writing and we both create in these different ways that we share with our audiences right Mm -hmm. but also there's got to be something that's private about it right and how like I guess balancing those two like how does that work for you yeah it's something I'm definitely figuring out like I mean when it comes to trauma it usually has to do with people I know (laughs) Mm -hmm. and I think that I've been definitely on a journey of figuring out like how do I be generous and vulnerable with boundaries with Instagram with my friends with the public but also how do I be respectful of the people that I know and also like giving myself the permission that it's okay if some of these things are private which is like a weird thing for me because in my mind I'm like it all put it all out there like you know (laughs) because it's good for everyone to know and it's you know something that's new that the previous generation never did so good for you but I think that I'm learning but the more time that goes on of like hey it's okay like for you to keep these things for yourself maybe you can write about the lesson but you don't need to go in detail about certain traumas because of many different reasons. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that there's so much to being authentic and vulnerable, just radical vulnerability. It's a thing, right? And I think being vulnerable is so important for us to do and to show everyone out there, especially if you have a marginalized identity. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there are certain things that you might not be ready to share, nor is appropriate to share. Yeah. And I don't know, I feel like one, there's a timing for everything. Yes. Like Mm. maybe in a couple years about this certain, you know, situation, I'll be at a place where it's safe for me to share, where it's honoring for myself, the other people and the story. Because I also think that there's certain dangers of sharing something that is really raw because it could be very triggering Mm. for me especially if it's open to other people's thoughts and comments. Yeah, definitely. You have to protect yourself and see what you need to do to heal first before displaying that vulnerability and like almost like working through that piece of art you have. Yes, I I don't know. I'm still figuring that out. I don't know exactly like where it's going or how it's going to play out in the long term. Definitely. Well, like you said, there's timing for everything, right? So that's okay. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is there anything that you've created in the past that like maybe, you know, you weren't ready to share that you were more ready to share later that you could think about, even if it was like back from your music days? Mm. Well, something I do kind of want to dive into in 2020 that I haven't before 
is writing more about romantic relationships. I've never been open about it and I've never written about it really. But mm-hmm. I think that, I don't know, I'm feeling like I want to share more about it. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, relationships, romantic or not, but definitely romantic one reflects certain attachments we have ever since we were young, right? Yes. So I think that, you know, it's never necessarily about the other person. I mean, it is, but it's also really about us. Yeah, exactly. And how are we working on childhood trauma? Mm -hmm. And I think that, like, anybody can relate to that, especially when it comes to attraction and attachment, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's amazing, you know, 10 years ago even, what I felt more attracted to in terms of not physicality necessarily, but just like an energy or a vibe from somebody versus now. I mean, I think we all go back and you know, we think about like our teenage years. We're like, oh my God, that person, like, how did I even like like them? But we did, you know, and yeah. we've grown. Um, but yeah, it like continues to evolve and definitely that childhood trauma and that inner child too, right? Yeah, inner child work is so important. I myself have started just very barely to look into inner child work. Mm. And the little I've done has already been so beneficial. What about you? How has that been for you? Or how do you think that's affected the type of work that you you create or your embodiment in your work, I guess? Well, it's funny because I feel like I'm new to inner child work. But if I think back over the years with different therapists, they've always done inner child work with me, but it's only clicked in recently. But what it's different is that I think that I'm able to access her more of on a daily level where I am more aware of like, okay, like this is when she's triggered or this is when I can see her and this is when I can nurture her and with artwork I think that it has played a big part because it's given me those opportunities to be present and to be curious do you know what I mean like it's given me that space and time to observe um, which I think without that practice I think it's a little bit harder to tap into that space Definitely. Um, I was doing this inner child meditation months ago, a little more regularly. Um, and this reminds me, I should probably get back to that, but um, it was all about observation, like observing myself in my childhood home, like Mm -hmm. hugging myself and telling myself, you know, words of encouragement or things I'd want to, you know, say to her. And I mean, it was super emotional. I mean, the first time I did it, I was in tears, you know, and that just, I think, demonstrates the power of inner child work but also you know how much we've evolved and how much we know ourselves but it is through this like outward observation which is really really fascinating so I could definitely see how that can be reflected in artwork like on a more conscious level yeah totally I mean it's just like I feel so grateful to even have these tools and like to have these sorts of techniques, but also like, okay, sorry, this is total tension. <laughs> but I was just going to say <laughs> um, how I think about like, like way back when in our more of indigenous roots of just like this kind of thing has always been there, like whether they've called it inner child work or not. Mm-hmm. And I just love to imagine my ancestors doing this like similar sort of work of self-healing and I want my artwork to go in that direction. Yeah, for sure. Um, Just kind of reckoning or understanding our actual roots. I don't want to say outside the context of white supremacy because it's like we said, it's in the air we breathe, but Mm -hmm. there was something there, you know, before and lifting that shroud and also diving deep is something to hope to go back to or hope to evoke, I suppose is the right yes. way to put it. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. But that definitely is, it's work. It's important work, but we need to also have breaks from <laughs> from all that healing, all that rushing of the healing that we're trying to do. <laughs> yeah, slow it down. Enjoy it. <laughs> oh my gosh, definitely. Is there anything else that you want to talk about um, in terms of your art or you know, what you're hoping to do in the near future in terms of any projects or, I don't know, anything? Yeah. 
Well, I'm still forming the concept of my next collection of artwork. And I mean, this has already changed the last time we've talked, but I'm kind of thinking about exploring what is Asian and kind of, I don't know, exploring like in the construct, like how has it been twisted? How has it been diminished, but also in its fullness? Like, what is it? Yeah. Um, what can we all connect over? What is so multifaceted? What are all the things in Asianness that most people don't even know about? I mean, it, there's so many different ethnicities and cultures within the word Asian that I would love to learn more about and call attention to. Yeah, most definitely. And I talk about that in my first episode where I just introduced this podcast about how Asia is a huge continent. It's a lot of people with a lot of nuance and we don't all have the same stories, which is, you know, the reason I wanted to do this podcast. So I think that, yeah, I mean, that is always something that we can explore for ourselves and what it, what it means on a larger level, but also what it means for ourselves, right? Yeah. And I'm so excited about this podcast because it's something that I want to be nourished by. I want to hear more stories, more perspectives and more things that like I don't know we can all really like how we can collectively heal together as we're you know telling stories and talking about these things yeah for sure definitely well I just want to close out on one last question for you if you were to tell your inner child something like right now um, what would you tell her oh oh god (laughs) okay I would tell her that she is she is loved, that she is worthy, and that she is okay where she is at, and that there is no need to rush, and that she is accepted. And also to tell her that her body is her friend, that mm. she can trust it, that her body is so resilient, and that is there for her. Yes. I love all of that. So good. Well, gosh, thank you so much, Tiffany. This was just like such an honor to talk to you. I'm so grateful for your work, obviously your permanent mark on the podcast with the cover art. For all of you out there, you know, when I had approached Tiffany about this, she had kind of asked me, you know, what I was looking for. And I gave her like some keywords and I, I, you know, sent her some of her pieces that I liked. And she just came up with this design concept and I just loved, you know, how it flowed and how it had the different colors. And, you know, I hadn't really talked to you about what the colors meant for you in terms of the grounding and the reddish brown, which I love. So I'm glad I got a little more clarity on that through this um, conversation. So thank you for that. And yeah, thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me and having me commissioned for the artwork. And I'm just, yeah, this is such a pleasure and an honor. So what Tiffany mentioned toward the end of our conversation reminded me about what I talked about in my first episode, this idea about what is Asian. I was reminded of an excerpt from Strangers from a Different Shore by Ronald Takaki. This book talks about Asian Americans through narrative and oral history. He summarizes and quotes a 1908 publication in the Overland Monthly written by Agnes Foster Buchanan, which goes like this. While white Americans wondered what should be done about the Japanese, they suddenly noticed another group of strangers, the Hindus. And here she is referring to immigrants from South Asia. Tall of stature, straight of feature, swarthy of color. They were unlike the Chinese and Japanese in an important way. They were brothers of our own race, full-blooded Aryans, men of like progenitors with us. But like the Chinese and Japanese, the Hindus were willing to work for cheap wages and able to subsist on incomes that would be prohibitive to the white men. So basically, even though the Hindus were deemed as more similarly racially to the white man, their willingness to be paid less altered their racial classification to be more similar to the Chinese and Japanese. Takaki further elaborates that two years later, in Forum magazine, Herman Schaffauer warned that Asian Indians represented a new kind of yellow peril. So this is a perfect example of how racial stratification is created and how it's impossible to separate race from economics. 
I'm really excited to see how Tiffany explores this idea given the really complex history behind Asian immigration. So thank you, Tiffany, for sharing this with us. I want to thank my Patreon patrons who have pledged $20 or more a month. Thank you to my brother, Indalia Gahan. Also, thank you to Tiffany for creating the cover art. You can find her on Instagram at Tiffany Wong Art. Thank you to Shin Kawasaki, who has an EP out on February 11th, 2020. Find him on all the streaming platforms as Shin Kawasaki, one word. And last but not least, thank you to the amazing Quincy Surasmith for your dazzling production skills on this podcast. Until next time, thanks for listening to Migrations. <laughs>